I recently talked to someone in business and they said this, I've gotten to the point where I'm more skeptical hiring a Christian because I've been burned so many times and I've been disappointed by their work ethic and integrity. Oh. And he said, I wish it wasn't that way. Does that hit you like it hits me? What if Jesus followers, what if it, those of us who follow Jesus were the most integrous, most hardworking, we were the best employees in the city to the point where business owners and managers were going out of their way to hire people of faith? How would it change the way that people view Jesus and the church? What would the church's reputation look like? Would it be different if Christians excelled at work and they were a blessing and they honored their bosses and, and, and people were saying, wow, I got to get some more of these kinds of people. I don't know what's going on with them, but I need more of them. How would it change the city? Recently, uh, there was uh, an event. Uh, anybody go to this event with Patrick Lencioni? Yeah, there's a number of hands here. This is a free event that was going on. It happened at Chico State. And Patrick Lencioni uh, taught, and he had this vision that he cast for our city. He said, I, I, I've been here to Chico several times before, and I, and I love this place, and I love the community. And he said, I've got this new information. After the fire happened, I had so much compassion. I wanted to do something to change Chico, to see it renewed, to see paradise rebuilt. And so I've decided to come. I wrote this new book, and I'm going to present this information in Chico here for the first time. And I want to give it as a gift to the city. And so he comped all 1,100 of us in the auditorium and gave us all free books. And he said, what would it look like? What would this city look like if managers really nurtured their employees and created a, a really good working environment, so much so that when they, they went home, their kids would be happier because dad or mom isn't in a bad mood and beaten down? How would it change how people are, are treated when uh, they're doing customer service in our city? What would the impact be if in the next year you took this information that I'm giving you as a professional and you actually lived it out and you managed your people in an engaged way? And he landed with this big a, a screen full that said, the ministry of management. By now, I'm re I've, he's really got my attention. The ministry of management, he says, this all comes back down to loving people well. He said, yes, I said it. I said the L word, love. But it's this nurturing that's necessary for us to be good bosses, and it will change this city. He said, you are all missionaries in this way back to create culture within your jobs. And I'm like, am I at Chico State right now? What's going on? So what would it look like in our city if it just wasn't really good employees, but it was really, really good bosses who loved well and actually applied the concepts that we see in the Bible? Good news. Within these letters to Timothy, we have some material that we can apply to that, and that's what we're going to do this morning. As we move through this series, the letters to Timothy, these are these are first and second Timothy, two books in the New Testament, both written by a man named Paul who had this spiritual son who was taking care of this church in Ephesus, and he had his hands full. And yet, he gives instructions not only to Timothy as an individual, but also to the church as well. And that's what we're going to see. This morning, we're going to look at just two verses where Paul is instructing the people in Ephesus, who are slaves, how to relate to their masters. And we're going to relate this to our modern attitude in work, toward our bosses and our employees in our lives. As we look at these two verses, and several other verses in the New Testament about slavery, actually, we're going to explore how it looks to make Jesus look good when we're at work. And we believe that work is a good part of life, not a direct result of sin. And as we solve problems and we serve well, I believe we have incredible opportunities to help others see how good Jesus really is. And when we are working and solving problems and serving others, we understand how signi our significance grows, and we build the kingdom. And so um, here's the text of these two verses. I'm going to read it to you. All you, 
All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they're brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. These are the things that you are to teach and urge on them. So what's going on here? Slavery. When you think about slavery, you may, well, maybe you think about your job and that fact that you feel like a slave. Perhaps uh, you're, you're at home and you just cleaned up the kitchen and you turn around and your two kids have messed up the kitchen since you went to the other room and you feel like a slave to their messes. Or perhaps you feel like a slave at your job because they will not give you a day off. Somehow you keep getting scheduled really weird work hours and you've communicated it and yet you feel trapped. Or you feel like a slave because you own the business and people don't understand. They think you're getting rich when you're barely making ends meet. You have all this pressure to try to take care of these employees and you're wondering how we're going to pay the bills this month and make it forward and yet everybody thinks that you're somehow slacking but you're working a million hours. You feel like slaves. Slaves in the first century, in the Roman Empire, uh, there was anywhere between 40 and 80 percent of the empire were slaves. So that means that most of the church were probably slaves or former slaves. And some slaves did horrible work. They would send them into mines and not let them out for days and days and days, not seeing the light of day. And their lives were, and their prospects were very dim. Other slaves were household slaves, and they could expect a more, uh, a more or less human treatment. In some cases, they had the opportunity to keep and manage some money uh, or even some property for themselves. And eventually, if they had enough property, they could actually buy their own freedom. Uh, think about these kinds of slaves as Alice from the Brady Bunch. Have you ever seen the Brady Bunch before? <laughs> Alice uh, is, is probably not making great money working for the Bradys. Uh, but she loves being a part of the family. And even if a better job came along, I don't think Alice would have ever taken it because she loved being a part of that family. And some slaves were in that context where they would e even choose to be slaves. It would actually be more financially uh, settling and secure for them to remain slaves and in this relationship that they were treated well in instead of being a freed person and being on their own. Now, slavery, when you hear that word, you think racially motivated uh, servitude. But in the first century, that's not necessarily what's going on. You've got people as a result of war and poverty that are trying to, they're, they're basically saying, I I've got to make it, and this is what I'll do to make it. Um, so I want you to make sure that you keep that clear in your mind with the context. For our purposes, we're going to look at the relationship between slaves and their work and masters and how it relates to us. To talk about this, I have a few friends. Friends who are on the panel, come on up here. I think I've managed to get all of the microphones and everything all set up. And I will introduce them as they're coming up. So, this right here is Michael Redman. He and his wife, Catherine, own a marketing firm in Chico called Half a Bubble Out. And uh, they preached about five weeks on passion and provision. You can find that on our video cast or our audio cast. Uh, How Work and Faith Coincide a couple years ago. Um, they also have a book coming out soon, and uh, they offer online training and coaching. Michael's been an employee, a business owner, and a manager. As an entrepreneur, he likes to think outside the box, and as such, he coaches and helps other companies to find a healthy place in pursuing passion and provision. So that's Michael Redman. You all can have a seat. It would feel more comfortable that way. Um, right next to me right here is one of my good friends, Ian Moore. He's overseeing a new division of managed IT at the Ray Morgan Company. As a sales uh, person, his numbers skyrocketed because of his honest approach and his ability to match service with real needs uh, in companies. Uh, so it was in his integrity uh, and his values that allowed him to perform so well, I believe. After a promotion to lead this new pioneering division, he has been uh, successful in sales, and uh, now he has challenges actually staffing all of the client load that they have, uh, that they have pulled in. Uh, he's also served many years as an employee and now leads other employees. In the middle there, that young lady is Jamie Happ. She works at Core Butte. Core Butte is the school that, that um, rents property from us at the south end of our campus. 
She works with families who are homeschooling their children. She understands that she has an incredible opportunity to bring the kingdom of God in her context. And she knows that there's ways to remain professional with her client families uh, and a blessing to her bosses at the school. As an employee, Jamie represents Jesus really well. And I'm really proud that she represents a bold faith on the other side of our campus to the watching educational world. And last but not least, Don and Vicki Cutler at the end. They own a company called Happy at Home, and they have, well, they have a lot of employees. Let's say over 100. Um, and uh, I know Don and Vicki both have worked in various contexts as a business owner, but also as an employee. They've also done a ton of hiring and learned a, f a few things along the way. Um, Don has learned um, how to leverage the strengths of his people to bless others. And I appreciate how their value for loving one another. It's really clear as I talk to them about business, and it it permeates it permeates his, uh, their business and personal life. These two are currently living in Oregon. We've loaned them to Oregon, uh, starting a new office of their business there, but we get to see them about one week in a month, so I'm really glad you're here. So we're looking at these two verses. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect. Full respect. Honoring your boss would be point number one. This, how, what, what does this look like, guys? Let's just, we're going to have a conversation, and we're going to let you listen in, and we're going to let our, our friends online listen in as well. Um, and if you are on Facebook Live, you can shoot in a question, and perhaps I can get to it as well. Hello, online people. So, um, so what's it look like? What's it look like to honor your boss? Maybe some real practical ways. We're getting, this can be really practical this morning. Okay. Is this on? Well, ready. <laughs> I think relating back to what you th mentioned earlier, um, the disgruntled employer hiring Christian um, applicants um, and being disappointed, I think as believers, we're held to a higher standard of serving. Um, whether you're the owner of the company, uh, in middle management, or um, you're employed by the company, you're held to a higher standard of service because we're not just serving our bosses. Um, we're serving our clients. We're serving our employees. But ultimately, we're serving God. Um, and we're called to serve well and um, for his glory so that people see him in us and in our service. So hopefully it wouldn't result in um, a disgruntled employer after hiring people of faith. Um, it's not a, a free pass to, to say, oh, we're both Christians, so I can just slide through and do the minimum. It's actually you're called to perform even better um, in, in your service to God. Yeah, that's so true. How about some practical ways? What, would it, what could it look like to honor your boss? I think I got a couple ideas. Um, so I think, number one, uh, empathy towards your boss. I think that employees can have a couple of different look, outlooks at this. Uh, one might be, must be nice to own your own business. Another one might be, how can I support this individual? And if anyone's done leadership, I, I use the metaphor that uh, being a leader is a little bit of, like bushwhacking through the jungle with a machete. <laughs> it's, it maybe is fun to be in the leader position for a little bit until you get hit with the sticks and brambles, and all of a sudden you want to move to the back. And as an employee, having the appreciation for the person in the lead, taking that initial brunt is very helpful. The other thing is that because that leader is taking that initial brunt, you are in a unique position as an employee to be able to see things that maybe the leader can't see because they have sticks and brambles hitting their face. And um, I, I, the analogy I would use for that is it's a little bit about like being like a backseat driver. Um, there are great backseat drivers that act more like co-pilots um, that, hey, you know, uh, is able to assist the individual as they're moving forward. And then there's the backseat driver that everybody knows that they don't like. <laughs> and I think that as an employee, it's very easy to be the same way, that if you're approaching that uh, business owner uh, without empathy and just criticizing, that that obviously is, is not glorifying God and not honestly not very helpful. Um, what is very helpful is, is stepping into more of that co-pilot role, role and, and saying, basically, how can I help and how can I assist here? Um, 
the last thing that I would say is that knowing the answer is a very small portion of the struggle. Uh, I'm a little bit younger guy turning turn 30 here, and um, like most of us, you know, in your teens and 20s, your, your whole mission is, hey, how do I find the right answer? And once I have the right answer, I know everything. And then you grow up and you realize that having the right answer is about 25% of the struggle. Um, <laughs> the other 25% is persuading people towards the right answer, and then that last 50% is probably creating healthy systems around that right answer. So as an employee, I constantly think to myself, one, uh, the right answer is not that important. It's more important how do I persuasively bring this to the table and then how do I help facilitate um, and, and help cause healthy systems in the midst of this. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be helpful to our bosses. We want to look out for them. We want to uh, try to keep them from failing. We can talk about a little, little later we'll talk about what it looks like to actually sabotage your boss and uh, not honor them that way. But any other ways that you can honor your boss? I th this is a really important question, so I want to take some time on Yeah, no, it's good. Um, I think speaking, I mean, I've been the boss for 17 years. That's a long time. Um, and I like to think of the guy before that is the old Michael and not the new Michael. Um, I would, I look at it this way. I, I look at it I, as I'm listening to all this stuff. I'm listening to it, thinking through the lens of the people I have working for me now. I have an amazing team working for me and have for quite some time and folks come and go and, and there's a lot of really cool testimonies of how people have come and gone and maybe we can talk about it a little bit later, um, especially on the leaving part. Uh, I'm amazed at A, I used to think I was smarter than I was, right? You get you 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 get you get more years in, and you start learning, but then you realize you can't do everything, and you need the team. If you're going to grow, like, and you've said it tons, Andrew, uh, you can go fast alone, but you can't go far alone. You've got to have a team, and I I love the folks that work for me, and I would consider them great employees because every time I turn around, it seems like somebody's going, "How do I help?" And my goal is to help them be as successful as they can at their job and give them what they need, but I am made uncomfortable at times by my employees at how well they serve me. And um, that's really fun. Hmm. Um, to add, is mine on? Um, there you go. Thanks. <laughs> uh, something that our leadership shared back a few weeks ago at the beginning of Timothy was something that's important is that um, when someone's name is safe on your lips. And I think of that as an employee. Um, also their policies and strategies. And that's something that um, I could even just confess to in this congregation that normally we have a very positive workplace. And just with the stress of this year, it's been a little bit different. But there's something, there's a few things that really need company. It's gossip, misery, and complaining. And we don't gripe and complain alone. And it's so tempting to, though I maybe, I love my supervisors and my boss, but um, when I caught myself grumbling about some of the new things we were doing um, with other employees, I had someone in his congregation, Terry Emmons, um, said, you know, I've been really convicted that we haven't been praying for our school, um, and we've been kind of grumbling about some of the things that have been added to our plates, and um, my heart wasn't super soft to that at first. I was like, well, but they're really hard to, you know. Um, and then the Lord gripped it later that night. <laughs> and it's true. It's absolutely true. And as believers, we can be that other force that comes in and changes that climate. And so I think, and that also, none of that was helping our leadership. And so as employees, I think to understand just how powerful, our words, our attitude, our posture, even our physical posture and our attitudes that we display on our faces um, is in the workplace and how when you multiply that, it can either make or break your workplace and the environment that it is and make or break how God is perceived in that case. I learned something from my stepdad. <clears throat> And I shared it with my kids and I share it with our staff and I, I really try to live by it. And it's a really simple, it boils down a lot of what everyone here has said. Do what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, whether you like it or not. Now, if you can do it with a, a great attitude, that's really the that's ultimate plus, goal. right? But yeah, it, it really does get noticed. 
um, from the employer side, when you see someone working, like just under those principles right there, do what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, whether you like it or not. It's really cool to see as an employer uh, think something needs to be done and you go out to check on it, it's already done. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, you want to make your, your, if you're working for anybody and you want to make somebody happy about that, I mean, folks, it works at home too, right? You get the dishes done before somebody's supposed to do it or you do take out the trash or anything else. People are, are tickled that they don't have to ask. And at work, it's the same thing. Yeah, I think Thanksgiving is uh, an un underrated uh, weapon in any environment to change the culture and the atmosphere. That when you begin to just be thankful, um, whether that's your, with your coworkers, but specifically we're talking about with whoever is your boss, um, thanking them, say, hey, thanks so much for, uh, for giving me this opportunity to do this job. I, I really appreciate it. Even if it's not a perfect job, even if they're not a perfect boss, you wait for a perfect boss to be able to say thank you, you're never going to say thank you to anyone ever because none of us are perfect. So... Thank them ahead of time. Thank, be, have that, 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 that gratitude uh, precede. It will begin to change the environment around you. And sincere compliments go a long ways. Insincere ones are flattery, and that looks really ugly. It makes you look like you're trying to get a raise. And it works against you. But sincere compliments, so like, hey, you did that really well. Thanks for, thanks for doing that. Or thanks for taking one for, for the team. Just to tag on to something you said, um, just know that it, okay, how do I say this? You shouldn't be saying something just to get a raise, like he said, but as Christians, okay, this is a boss speaking, and if you were in my shop, I would say this to you. Don't be afraid to ask for a raise if you think it's appropriate and timely or you need it. Um, I just lost a great employee, a fantastic employee, because he got an amazing opportunity. He cried when he said goodbye to us. So he loved us and everything else. But what he didn't expect, he didn't think it was appropriate to come to me and say, I got this offer. I would like to stay here. Can you match it? And I would have written the check instantaneously to keep him, and he didn't give me the opportunity. As Christians, sometimes we get into this place where we think it's inappropriate for me to ask. And in a mature conversation, ask. It's okay to do that. I, you didn't even mean to go there, but that's a sensitive spot for me right now. So I want to have those dialogues. If you want to honor your boss, have an open conversation and then be willing to accept no. I can't do that. I'm sorry. The budget's not there. But I want to have the conversation with my employees. Um, and I know, unfortunately, not every boss does. But uh, the more we walk in Christ, I think the more we can have healthy conversations that are challenging. Piggybacking off that from the employee standpoint. Um, so uh, one thing that stuck with me a long time ago that I was heard that if, if you're a producer, you should go into business for yourself. If you're not a producer, you should go into business for somebody else, right? Because just being extremely selfish. What do you mean by producer? So produ produ like um, if you are more of an asset than a liability, if you, if, you if you bring more to the table than what you're paid, you should go into business for yourself. If you are the opposite, you should go in business for someone else. That's a worldly wisdom for you, right? So um, <laughs> it's always stuck with me though. And, and one of the things that I constantly keep in mind when I'm wearing my employee hat is, I, I think a lot of us are just looking for a fair shake. And, and if you want a fair shake, you should probably go work for yourself. If you want an unfair shake, you should actually go work for an employer because you have to be generating income as an employee to make it beneficial to that employer. And so there's a constant struggle in my mind as an employee that's, okay, how do I walk the fair line of, I need to get paid a certain amount. But then also simultaneously understanding as a Christian, I'm wearing a different hat, and that different hat is telling me for every dollar that I produce over what I am paid, I am generating favor. Right? So, so one of the ways that I earn favor at my job is I know that I am creating more value for the company than what it costs them. And every dollar that's generated over that amount is a very practical way in which I earn favor with my bosses that I am then able to trade in at a later date. It, from the worldly wisdom would say trade those in for selfish gains. Um, but what I would say is that Christ says, you know, take every dollar that you've accumulated as favor, and then you can trade it in at a later date for something like, wow, you know, this is a really fruitful employee 
and then you have the opportunity to put in a piece of wisdom that's pure Jesus. And because you've gained that favor, because you're an asset, not a liability, there's a lot more that comes, a lot more weight that comes with that than if you were just stealing from the system, so to speak. So it's a constant battle of how do I, how do I receive as much as I need to take care of my needs and, and, and be well taken care of, but how do I simultaneously know that hopefully what I'm bringing in is greater than that, and that's actually okay, and that's actually good, and that I'm strategically trading that in for Jesus. Yeah, this is a great segue to verse two, which says, those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they're brothers. Instead, we are to serve them better because those who benefit from their service are believers and are dear to them. There is a, a, a fondness and a, and a love that's going on in these employees' hearts to say, I want my boss to succeed. I want his company to thrive. I want him to be able to do charitable things with his money that would benefit the kingdom. I want to make sure that our company does well so that we could sponsor the Run for Food this year, which we did. Um, and so that, what is it that you, you could get your eyes on to benefit your boss or the company and in a way that is a blessing? So have you ever seen someone take advantage of a Christian boss? What's this look like? I mean, I think Vicky hit on it at the very beginning, right? So what, it, this doesn't ever happen, right? I mean, we're all such good employees. We would never presume upon someone else. I'm assuming that that must be the case because Paul is writing this. So what does it look like? Go ahead. <laughs> this is the stickiest question I'm going to ask today. Go ahead. I think maybe um, people might misinterpret their dear relationships that are mentioned in First Timothy um, as favoritism, and maybe you think, "Oh, we're we're I have an in because we're both believers." Yep. So. Um, because of that relationship, I don't have to work as hard or produce as much or, you know, we're more equals in Christ. They're, they're not better than me just because they're my boss. <laughs> so I think it could lead to that kind of taking advantage of that situation with the wrong attitude. Um, I liked what Jamie said about um, controlling our words and our attitudes in the workplace um, and also the power of prayer is, we've seen it in our business over and over, the power of prayer, even if other people aren't aware of it, to resolve conflicts, to develop better business practices, to overcome challenges, mm. the power of prayer has just been, God has just rained down in our business and solved so many issues. Um, when we just hit our knees, <laughs> we don't know. We don't always have the right answers, but God does, and we just pour out to Him in prayer, and He has shown His favor. Mm. Well, you guys extend a whole lot. I mean, by the nature of your business, you have to extend a lot more trust because your folks are out in people's homes, right? Correct. So, so that's a. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for that because that's that's even another level or two or three beyond what I have to do most of the time is because I get to see my employees most of the time, and, I'm, and you are trusting, hey, I'm gonna put you in these people's homes, not only are you gonna carry, do a good job, you're gonna respect the name and everything else, and there's no oversight, at, that, at, a, at least at a daily level, right? Right, yeah, we have very little contact with, uh, with our staff um, out in the field, because they're out there loving others. So, um, uh, something that struck me um, was a story where there were a couple of investors who, who wanted to help us grow our business. Uh, well, that help really was, we want to weasel way, our way into your company. I recognized early on that these were sharks. These were snakes. These were not people that we were ever going to entertain being in business with. But one question that I wanted to bring up that they brought up is at, at a meeting, the first and the last meeting that we had with them, they brought up this other company. We'll call them Acme. Acme uh, Home Care Service. They were talking with them, and they asked, what was the greatest challenge that they have? And right away, they jumped into complaining and griping about their employees, staffing, staffing, staffing. I stopped them right there and, and said, we don't have that problem. And they, they stopped and said, what? What do you mean you don't have that problem with, with uh, staffing and finding great people? And I said, because I turn it over to the Lord every time. 
I give it to him. He finds the great people. We don't. And exactly what Vicky said, we, we just offer a prayer. He finds the way. He solves it. Now, have we had issues with employees? Yeah. People change. People have struggles. They have a lot of different challenges in life. I do. We all do. Um, but making sure that... Um, that our first priority is to seek God's counsel first and, and leave it up to him. That is what has made the difference of finding great people. He finds them. We don't. Mm. Okay, I got a story. I got two stories. One, and one of them, self-confession. When I was, before Catherine and I were married, I worked for a guy. I was fairly new in the Lord. Even though I grew up in church, old Michael. And uh, old Michael worked in a warehouse, and old Michael had access to borrow legitimately borrow um, a VCR. And then Michael left the company, and Michael didn't give back the VCR. Uh, Michael stole the VCR. <laughs> it didn't, I didn't have the intent to steal it, but I did. Then I got embarrassed, and then I got married, and then, the, and then I became a pastor, and then the Lord really convicted me. <laughs> and I had to confess. And so I, I, the Lord convicted me to actually go back and say to this person um, that I was sorry. So actually, because they lived in a different city and everything else, I packaged the VCR up. I put a letter in it. I was willing to pay any recompense that needed to happen or anything else. They, they accepted my apology with grace. I actually ran into the guy two years, you know, five years later, and he brought it up, and he goes, I thought you joined AA, and you were just going through step two or three. Because <laughs> he was a recovering drug addict. So, um, and, and we laughed. Uh, he was also, he'd come to the Lord, and I didn't, I found out that day that I didn't think there were certain people who could come to the Lord, because I didn't think he'd ever come to the Lord. So we had quite a conversation. Um, I then had an employee who uh, needed to be, um, his time had come at the office several years ago. It was time for him to move on. We had to coach him out. Um, it's different than a fire. It's like, do you think you should still be here? No, I don't think I should still be here. And productivity had gone down for months. Uh, two or three years went by, three years went by, and we got an email from him, and he wanted to meet with Catherine and I in the evening after everybody left. I'm like, what is going on? And he sat there. This kid was sweating. He was trembling. And he was confessing that he had spent probably the last six months working for us more than half the time working on his own business ideas. And the Lord had just hammered him. Okay, lesson number one. You start learning this kind of stuff, and you start hearing from the Lord, and you want to follow him, he will dog you. I, these are, oh, the hounds of heaven will come after you. Um, personally, and I'm watching it with this young man, and then he goes, my wife is at home praying. And he offers to, he, first of all, he confesses and he apologizes. And we were just so grateful to extend the grace that Catherine and I have received so many times in our life when we've blown it. And then he offers to pay us back for all the hours that he wasted. And he and his wife don't have much money. And it turns out she was at home trembling and praying on her knees that we would have grace because she didn't know how they were going to do it. And I'm sitting there going, this kid just is awesome because he's trying to be sensitive to the Lord. And when you blow it, um, it can be very humbling and embarrassing to go admit you blew it. But I believe that the Lord really honors that. The funny thing is I'm sitting there going, I don't want his money. I don't need his money. Um, and I don't even know how to, I'm thinking in my head, I don't know how to collect this. I don't know how to take taxes on it. I don't know. How, I'd, I'm better off if I don't take your money. <laughs> I didn't tell him that, but I'm like, you, it was so sweet. And to this day, he has such a special place in our heart not because he blew it and stole from us, because that's what he did, but he had the grace to listen to the Lord and come back. Mm. And he yeah. will have my extra level of trust and endearment for as long as I can imagine because of what he did, because of yeah. the courage he had. Yeah, that's great stuff. Um, the idea that my performance shouldn't mean I lose my job because you're a Christian boss. Try working for a church and trying to remove them from their job. 
But that's different. <laughs> it's not different. He's kidding, by the way, if you don't know Michael. But it is, it is true that I counsel more people that get offended that their Christian boss has let them go because they ought to have a lot more grace for me because they're a Christian. They know better. Sometimes you're just not doing your job, and it's not a good idea to keep you any longer. You're not entitled to perform poorly for a, a company just because someone's a Christian. Boy, that felt really heavy. It didn't Amen. mean to be. Preacher. Yeah. <laughs> Many times, as an employee, we don't recognize that our performance is poor. We don't. We're working hard, but we're not working very well or very smart. We're not adding value to the company, and that's what we're supposed to do as an employees. Trust me, employers notice that. Whether you're Christian or not, employers notice if you are dead weight. And if you don't recognize that, it's the employer's job to bring it to your attention. Now, usually it comes out through review. So if you're an employee that is being reviewed, um, don't necessarily take it personally. Take it to heart and try to better your, uh, your abilities, your service to, uh, uh, to your employer. If, you, if it's the other side, make sure you give the, the, that individual that opportunity to improve. Mm. You never want to blindside someone um, where they didn't see it coming. Um, and you, you want, whether that's through formal review or just call them into the office and have a conversation, however it is you want to go about it, make it brief and say, you're doing this, I need you to do this, for example. So. Well, I think as an employee, too, um, uh, sometimes you get mixed up that it's the obligation of your employer to tell you where you're going. It's, it's the obligation, it's your personal responsibility to know where you're going in life, right? And a lot of times a, a manager, an employee, or a boss will help you do that and help you know where you're going in life. But as an employee, I, I believe it's your responsibility to figure out where do you want to be in 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And and if your current position is helping you on that track, because the the best situations, right, the, the huge benefit that we have living in the United States of America is that we can ch choose who we want to work for. And so it's not the same slavery situation that Paul had where you couldn't necessarily swap to a different industry. If you know where you're going in life, you should, for the sake of your employer, you should have that idea that you are in a win-win situation. It's a huge benefit that we have in this country that we can seek win-win situations, and there's a lot of them out there. And so as an employee going through that thought process, and it's always, you know, it's a, you can always see someone who has a plan for their life and who is strategically pursuing it because there's a fire underneath them. There's a fire that's benefiting them, it's benefiting those around them, it's benefiting their employer. And so if you can, if at all possible, try and get in those win-win situations because at that point, you truly are both winning. You're getting experience in the arena that you want to get experience in. Your employer is receiving the benefit of your fire and drive. And if you can strategically align yourself that way, I think, I, I mean, that's just gold. That's yeah. just where you're, you're yeah. winning. Um, Coming back to context of even this time, the church was under persecution. And I think of, <laughs> but as believers, especially in a place of leadership, so thinking of our bosses or those who are supervising us, um, they're in a place of persecution as well. Because you think of even corporate America or you know, I teach at a public school, um, it's not easy. And I think the last thing, what Paul's really saying, the last thing they need is for their brothers and sisters to also be making it harder. And so we should yeah. be cheering them on, challenging them, praying for them. Um, and something I was reading this week is, um, you know, whether you're in a secular position or a um, spiritual position, everything that we do can be sacred. Our mm -hmm. job is... That's right where God has placed us, and that is sacred, to be walking where God has you. And so um, to be in that privilege, if you do, I am blessed to also have two um, believing bosses and to have the privilege to be able to support them and to pray for them and to the, for them to know that uh, I will submit to them because that's also modeling submission um, is so empowering to them and so empowering to um, the kingdom as well. Which is a great segue to this, these two verses because sometimes honoring your boss is not easy. 
None of you can relate to that because you all have perfect bosses. But some of us have had imperfect bosses. That's why Paul says, uh, Peter says this in 1 Peter 2, 18. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. What? <laughs> Titus 2. It's another one of the pastoral epistles written by Paul to Titus, who was on Crete as a pastor, just kind of like Timothy was a pastor at Ephesus. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, to not, try to, to, to not talk back to them, to not steal from them, and to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Notice the why keeps coming up. Why? Because we want, we want Jesus to be famous. We want him to look good. We don't want to send a competing message about who God is by our performance at work and how we handle things. So um, just a couple quick things here for the sake of time because I want to get to bosses because we need to boss bosses around for a few minutes. Um, there's some talk here about doing things wrong like stealing Stealing, we oftentimes think about as money uh, taken out of the cash drawer. Don't do that. That's wrong. I shouldn't have to tell you that. But what are other more subtle ways that we steal at work? The, um, <clears throat> without a doubt, I, I was in a previous position where I was an employee. I actually had to do a study to, to, uh, um, to evaluate um, how efficient our workforce was and develop procedures and policies, how do we get a true eight hours out of an eight hour day? Um, the, the best I could ever get was about 6.75 hours, which in any in industry, that's actually really good. So to the point to answer your question, what is the most common thing stolen? Time. Absolutely time. So in California, you get uh, two 15 minute breaks every two hours and you get a 30 minute break um, yeah, for every five hours that you're at work. That's basically fundamentally the rule. And um, it is really, it's very, very common for individuals to turn 15s into 30s, turn 30s into 45s or 50s, and that is absolutely stealing, period. And a story where, when I was a contractor, uh, I was a subcontractor at the time, and, uh, and I didn't actually witness this, but I, I knew that it happened. I knew the general contractor well, and I knew his crew, and I knew his crew were sitting on their lunch boxes, and those 15s were turning into 30s, and the 30s were turning into an hour, and he walked, uh, he came onto the job site. They didn't really notice, uh, as the story was told to me, did, they didn't really notice he was there. He walked right into the middle of them, and they all were like, oh, and they're way past their 15-minute break, he took a, his wallet out, took a $100 bill out, and lit it on fire in the group of these five or six uh, laborers and let it fall to ash in the middle. He goes, this right here is exactly what you were doing to me. You were stealing from me. I pay you well. I expect a full day's work. I think they got the message. I, I really do. Um, I don't know if I would have... Uh, uh, burned a hundred dollar bill in front of them, but he, if the hundred dollar bill was an investment in their future to do right and not wrong, then it was well spent. So I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I wouldn't argue with it at all. You, usually like, uh, when we do consultation on business, we'll look at a couple different things. You tend to look at productivity, assets, and culture, right? So when you go to assess a business, those are kind of the, the main three that you look at. And I would say all of those are opportunities for an employee to steal, whether that's productivity primarily with time, assets, those may be physical, or really more, more and more what we're running into now is intellectual property. Mm. Um, and then uh, the last one, culture, nothing worse than um, taking away from a good culture and turning it sour. Not to be confused with VCRs, which sometimes come up <laughs> missing from the warehouse, which is a good segue to uh, how do you build trust with a boss once you've lost trust? Because this verse is talking about uh, trust and uh, being fully trusted. This might be a good one for Michael to answer since this has been an area of teaching for him. Could you repeat the question I was how thinking you, about a VCR? Build, <laughs> sorry, that's my bad. Uh, how do you build trust with a boss where you've lost trust? Well, uh, the story I told a few minutes ago was a really good one. Um, trust, it's real important to go back to the remember the principles of trust. Trust is based, a, based on competence and character. Competence and character. And intent is involved in there and stuff like that if you study it. And I think if you've lost trust, one of the things that's important to realize is trust is lost usually in a character aspect. 
where I see you, you, you said you were going to do something you didn't, I doubt your character. A lot of people want to say I'm sorry and sorry and sorry and build it up, and they want to build it up in that kind of that character relationship space. And actually, trust doesn't work like that. Trust works the opposite. It's really interesting. You lose it in character the fastest. You rebuild it the fastest in competence. Mm. So you say, first step, I blew it, and you have to own it. If you don't blow it and own it, you actually waste a bunch of your time trying to build trust because it takes 10 times longer for anybody to see it because nobody's really sure that you cared or not. Once you say you were wrong and you asked forgiveness, then working hard and being consistent on a rep repetitive basis mm -hmm. builds trust way faster. And that's whether it's in a marriage or at work or anywhere else. So if you can understand how trust, the, the anatomy of trust works, then you can rebuild trust really quick and it works. Great. So I want to ask you all this last question. It has to do with bosses. Uh, because we see verses like Ephesians 6, which says, Masters, treat your slaves in the same way with honor and respect. Don't threaten them, since you know uh, that he who is both mas your, their master and yours is in heaven. There's no favoritism with him. Then Colossians 4, which says, Masters, provide your slaves with what's right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Interesting, He's Paul's using in these two different books almost the same line of reasoning word for word. And then Paul goes on to say, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. So I'm going to uh, have each of you um, respond to this question, uh, and then I'll close up here because we're about out of time. But what would you like to say to bosses? There's a few things in these verses you can look at and you can play off of. Um, but what do you think? I remember reading, the, well, I didn't actually read the book. I worked for, um, for someone, we were actually in business together uh, through a partnership in a gymnasium. And right well, soon after this relationship started, I recognized this individual didn't have any integrity. And then he brought up this book that I did not read that the title of it is Real Bosses Don't Say Thank You. And it all became very, very clear um, how wrong he was. Um, be thankful, be grateful uh, to, your, to your staff. Um, lead by example. Don't just tell them what to do. Show them, if you can, show them what to do. Now, I have employees who are skilled, much more skilled at things than I am. I can't really teach them some of those skills. They're, they're better at it than me. Um, and that's fine. I tell them that. You're really, really good at this. Um, pour into them. Uh, as much as you can, if it's appropriate, some, because sometimes it isn't, um, to outwardly say, hey, I, I, can I pray for you? Um, sometimes you want, it to be, you want that message to be well received. Certainly you pray for them silently, you pray for them at home. Um, but uh, but if, uh, if you have that opportunity to bless them that way, take that opportunity often, frequently, let them know in your way, how much you love and care for them and, and how much you, they mean to your organization. That's great. Yeah, I would ag agree. And just expounding on that, um, Don is excellent at speaking blessings over employees. They come with challenges, whether transportation or scheduling conflicts or whatever the challenge may be of the day. He helps, he listens, first of all, just listen. Sometimes they just need an ear to listen. Um, and then sometimes you can help guide them through life's challenges and find solutions. Um, and always speak blessings and show appreciation in it and acknowledge their um, contributions. Um, <clears throat> I know caregivers work hard. It's a, it's a heart and soul kind of a position. Uh, it can be very challenging and demanding and draining. So we try to fill them up like Christ fills us up, <laughs> we pass that on so that they can go out into the field with full cups and serve others and love others well. Um, I think specific affirmation is big, uh, even in my teacher role. So I also get to oversee not only kids, but um, mamas, dads, grandmas, grandpas who are teaching their kids. And when you say, you're doing a great job, there's been times so much in the past with other supervisors, I'm like, how do you know? It doesn't mean a lot until it's, you know what, I saw you the other day spend that extra hour or um, take that kid aside or 
you know, speak love into this person. And I really appreciate that. It means a lot to our company. It means a lot to me. Um, and I think even just asking for your, their thoughts, because it's also demonstrating that you value their mind, you value what they are bringing to the company. And it goes a long way in melting um, even other thoughts that might be in there that um, it just... How can you not want to serve someone who appreciates you? Go ahead. Well, um, a real quick story um, to value your time here. But, I, you know, I went through a situation, unfortunately, in a previous uh, employment where I had a boss that didn't follow these things. And so we had just gotten out of this major project where played a key role in, in helping us close it and you know, really had invested big time. This employer then had decided to move and uh, had promised me X amount of months of employment followed by kind of a package at the end so that, to take care of my family. At the time, we're living off one car, commuting, living in an apartment, money's tight. Glad that we we're able to negotiate this. Month into it, changes his mind says, nope, sorry, actually, we're not going to do that, and um, uh, you're, you're done in a week. What? <laughs> so, um, you know, so first on that, um, you can do everything right as an employee, and that's not going to guarantee that they're going to do it right. There's certainly times in my life where I've had my character be perfect, and it's led to Christ working on that person's heart and having a conversion off a person that was totally hardened. But then there's also going to be times where you can do everything right and, and someone's just going to make bad decisions. And, um, you know, one thing that I could see as a risk as a result of a Christian reading this would be, well, I need to just suffer under a bad boss. That's certainly not true. And, and for a lot of us, I read a LinkedIn article a while ago that was like something crazy, like 90% of people's happiness has to do with who their direct managing boss is. <laughs> so um, that's something to keep in mind. But the beautiful thing in the, in the midst of this is um, I had a, another boss that's greater than the boss that I previously had, and that's Jesus. And, and that boss is, was always where my paycheck was coming from. And so while there's some emotional turmoil in the midst of that, I, I kind of knew, hey, I'm going to be okay. I, I was lucky enough to then roll into my current position, but as a telemarketer, and I'm sure there's no one that's going to raise their hand in the audience and say the first thing they want to become is a telemarketer. So... I took a massive uh, pay decrease um, from an account executive to a telemarketer. I'm doing things that I don't love, I don't want to do. And the whole time I'm asking Jesus, hey, we good? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you're good. Like, this is where you're supposed to be. And as a result of that, it's progressed me into, a, I, I couldn't even, I, I'm, I'm in a great spot. It's exactly where I wanted to be. I never would have known it when I took that initial job as a telemarketer. And, and really, as I've walked through more and more experiences of those, it almost comes to a point where you get a curveball and you're like, okay, cool, Jesus, what's next? Because you've seen him be so faithful. And so keeping that relationship of, yes, I serve a boss, but I have a master up above that that's providing everything else is a, a sweet deal and uh, something that we're very fortunate as Christians to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to affirm that you are good at pouring into people. I mean, the interactions that you and I have have not been many over the years, but as I've preached on this stage and come off and different things like that, you've always been super encouraging to me and warm in our interactions as short as they have been. I just want to, I mean, just, yeah, you, you're, you're good, good at that. that right? Now too. right? <laughs> okay. Um, the, I was checking my phone earlier, not because I was checking a text, but I was checking our, the Bible. I was checking a text not a text. Right. And, the, um, the text of the Bible. Right. Thank you very much. 6.4 talks about fathers. And this is, this is actually in a, a lineage of how we're supposed to behave. And there's a theme that runs through it. It says fathers basically don't anger your children. I think that sentiment that runs through all of it is partly in that of I'm not supposed to be as an employer, a leader of any type. Uh, I need to be careful that I'm not enticing or angering people in an un... I shouldn't be doing it all. I need to be careful of that. And you know the sentiment in that text. The other thing is to speak again on the encouragement part that's being said here. Like there's like some amazing statistics and math. We're writing this book right now, so we're deep in the research on the catalytic like multiplication effect of actually saying you did a good job and even more importantly what you said of being specific. Mm -hmm. You did a good job, or you're doing a great job, you did a great job on this specific thing, because we all desire to be respected by our, uh, those in authority over us, 
We all desire to be respected and appreciated by the people around us and seen as competent and trustworthy. And that type of thing in the midst of the community, when it's done in a healthy way, is phenomenal for us. And you, we can all do it. And it's great for the bottom line, because I think God cares about the bottom line, too. Mm -hmm. Great. As we close up, I just want to remind you that uh, verses like Colossians 3 explain that when you work hard, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if you're working for the Lord, not men. Since you know you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, there are rewards that God says he gives to those who work hard and actually apply these things. Sometimes we're afraid as Christians to think about rewards and think, oh, we're just doing it for the rewards. Well, I don't know about you, but rewards work pretty well with employees here at the church. Rewards work pretty well with my kids. Rewards work pretty good with me, actually. They're motivators, and, and God uses rewards in order to motivate us. And so uh, let that also be uh, something significant for you um, to realize as we close. So I want to, um, as we close, I want to just speak out a couple words that I was hearing uh, while we were going. I want to encourage those of you, a, a few people asked some questions on the live feed um, that were really good questions we didn't get to. I want to encourage you, come up and talk to one of these, uh, these five afterwards. They're going to be down here and, and just ask your, your question because there were some really, really good questions that came in. Uh, but there's a few other people that I think you're supposed to come up and maybe get some prayer for one of, from the, one of these five or our prayer team that will come up. Um, someone is fearful of losing their job. And you've been uh, paranoid about others talking about you at your job. And if that's you, you need to know that God has you and you need to allow someone to pray with you through this so you're not living in fear constantly. The second one is this. There, I think there's a business owner here who's struggling with how to have a really hard conversation. And this is a key member of your team that you're wrestling with, but you don't know how to have the conversation. And there's actually a fear in there that if you don't handle it well, they're going to leave. Um, and you need godly wisdom. You need someone else to bounce this off of. Um, and so these folks are up here. Uh, I, I just feel like you need to widen the circle. Um, there's also someone here who's afraid to encourage your staff because you've never done it before. And you're really afraid you're going to feel so hypocritical when you start doing that, when you start speaking blessings instead of just, just being kind of hardline all the time. It's time to actually go to your team and confess it to them. Say, you know what? I've had a revelation. I'm going to do better at this. I'm really sorry. Let's move on. If you don't make that, that strong statement to them admitting you've been wrong, it will feel hypocritical. And lastly, there's a fourth one. I think there's someone who's thinking or wondering if you should quit or change your job. Um, I want you to come and pray with one of these folks. I just really believe the Lord's going to give you a word to encourage you uh, to unlock some wisdom, okay? Would you please thank you, panel. Would you uh, thank our panel with me? Great job. Some great wisdom prayer, folks. If you'd come down front, we would love to pray for you this morning. Thanks for sticking a few uh, minutes extra with us. Thanks for sticking online with us, online friends. Uh, may God bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. And I want to speak this word over you, Psalm 90, verse 17. May the favor of the Lord rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. May our work be a blessed and kingdom-building culture. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll see you next week.